Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm sitting down today with a very special guest. We've got Antoine Thompson, far better known as Amadeus, joining us. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, Mitch, as well, man. An honor to be here. Big, big, big fan of the brand. So this is a definitely a monumental moment for me, man. So I appreciate you having me here today. Well, thank you for saying so, man. That's that's very kind. And I know how busy you are. You got a, you got a few irons in the fire. Yes, sir. <laughs> Trying to keep it hot. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to keep it hot. I, uh, when I interview someone, there's always those... He's a guitarist, producer, composer, but you're like like drummer, music director, producer, composer, author, educator. I mean, the list just keeps going and going and going, right? Yeah, man. You know, I I believe that we all have so many gifts and talents, and I just feel like we should tap into each and every single one of them. It's it's very difficult to do and and to balance out and keep up with. But, you know, if, if you have all these gifts and talents, you know, not, why not use them all and share them with the world? So that's that's pretty much my motto and why. You know, I do so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a, a part of that is also just taking advantage of the opportunities when they come up because that's how you Absolutely. grow, right? You keep improving, you grow, you have opportunities that leads you in a new direction. And all of a sudden you got another slash on your, uh, your title there that you're adding in. <laughs> Amazingly said. I love how you put that. I like that. Oh. There you go, Mitch. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so take us back. Take us back to the early years uh, when you were starting out in the Bronx. Whew. Blood, sweat, and tears, man. I tell you that. You know, <laughs> even when you think back to it, and you're like, Wow, I really made it here. Um, you know, again, from the Bronx, as you mentioned, thank you for that. Uh, 169th Washington Avenue to be exact, projects over there, very tough environment, very tough neighborhood. Um, I can honestly sit here today and say that music uh, was the thing that saved my life, was the thing that kept me going in the right direction uh, in a positive manner. Because, uh, you know, surrounded by drugs, surrounded by gangs and negativity and violence, you know, so many diff- different distractions and things that I can chose. I, I could chose, but music it's just it was just there to me. I was surrounded by it by my parents. So thanks thanks to mom and dad for introducing me to music, all genres. Um, and and I fell in love with hip hop. You know, right. kind of a little frowned upon growing up in my home because the, the hip hop that I gravitated towards and the hip hop that my parents appreciated was definitely two different worlds, two different way, two different lanes. A lot of profanity. Uh, in the lyrics and the music that I listened to, a lot of cusses and, and, and they, they just didn't approve of it. And they were kind of concerned that I would listen to this music and go in the direction in regards to what I was listening to and what I heard. And I would try to convince them like, you know, mom, I don't even know what it's called, but it's kind of like the music and th- what's happening in the background that really has my intention. And it's really what I'm gravitating towards. I didn't know it was production. I didn't know what it was titled, but I just kind of shared that with them. And they were like, mm, I don't know about that. So uh, fourth grade, I was introduced to the drums. Uh, I attended a school called St. Augustine School of the Arts. And in that school, every every student had to learn a musical instrument. And it was a part of the program. Uh, you know, you didn't have a, a choice whether you wanted to or not. It was something that you had to do. And mm-hmm. I really wanted to learn a trumpet and a saxophone. Um, I was ax- absent on the day that I was able to choose that instrument. Uh, the next day I showed up, there were two many instruments left. One was the violin. One was percussion. Again, me being from the Bronx, you know, from a very tough neighborhood, I already was a target because I had to dress up, slacks, shirt, tie, shoes. So I was already getting mocked and, and teased for that. So the, the one thing I wasn't going to do was add a violin case to that. So <laughs> right. not even knowing what percussion meant, I was like, I'm just going to go with that. And showed up in the class, learned that that had, that had everything to do with drums and rhythm. Um, and it was love at first sight. Got on drums, was able to mimic the same thing my teacher uh, played first, and that was the start, and the rest was history. Right on, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I read a great story about you, uh, you starting to play in church and being on percussion. And then they let you get onto the MPC, and then they let you get on the drum kit. And how did that influence right. your development as a musician? Oh, it was incredible. Um, you know, of course, I was kind of introduced to jazz and theory and, and all of that in school. And what sucked was that the school that I was in, uh, I had to go to a different school, mm-hmm. and so I was only was able to take drums for, I think, one year, either one or two years, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then when I went to the other school, Christ King in the Bronx, they had a music program, but it was something that you had to pay for. Um, and for me and my siblings, my parents put us in Catholic school, so they was already paying tuition for myself and my siblings, so that, you know, that rent, life, food, all those different things, they couldn't, you know, afford to, you know, for me to continue in music. Mm-hmm. So for me, going to the church, that was an amazing outlet that I had musically and I was able to participate as a, as a, as a percussionist at first. And then I graduated to the drummer 
But that's where I really developed as a musician, and as a producer. That's where all of the sauce and the seasoning and the spice and the swag as a musician kind of started developing for me. And then I kind of transi- transi- transitioned into production once I really fully understood what it was. Like it was the beats. It was the music that I was hearing in the background behind the melody and the lyrics that the MCs and the artists would perform. So once I realized what it was and I knew what it was, then I knew and learned about the MPC and, and all of the keyboards and the sound modules that you would put together in regards to, you know, creating and building tracks. And that's pretty much, you know, how it got started for me. Right. How did you become aware of that? Aware of what was going on with producers and as you were getting started? So, uh, you know, the musicians at my church, shout out to my brother, Steve Soup White. He was a drummer at the church at the time. He was kind of already in production, so I was kind of following in his footsteps. My minister of music, Derek Godbo, at the time he actually passed away, so rest in peace, DG. He had bought the Roland XP50. He didn't even know what it was. Just bought it. They they told him it was hot. He comes into the church and was like, hey, I got this new keyboard. And it's like, it's a sequencer. And I didn't even know what a sequencer meant at the time. And he's like, you could actually put and build tracks together in this keyboard. So I remember taking his keyboard home. You know, of course, us musicians, and I'm sure you can relate, Mitch, we hate the manual. So (laughs) he's like, here's the manual. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? He was like, read it, dude, so you can learn. And I was like, nah, man, I'll figure it out. So I actually figured it out, started programming and sequencing on his his keyboard, actually taught him how to sequence and program on his keyboard. And that's, so I kind of really started understanding the, the, the production world, understanding how it worked. And then it was kind of like the research and really studying and, and understanding what was happening. Because at that time, it's even, even though I was young, it was a passion of mine already. Like, I really loved it and I really gravitated towards that. And, you know, as a kid, whether it's sports, music, whatever it is that you love, you love something, all you do is eat, sleep, drink, and think that thing. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yep. So I would ask questions. I would be surrounded by fellow musicians in church. And it was a family friend by the name of Buck Wow who was a very established producer, multi-platinum producer, a part of Bad Boy Hitman, had produced for the Notorious B.I.G., Faith Evans, Mace, Jay-Z, and he was a family friend. And my mom was like, listen, my son is talking this beat stuff. Come pick him up, take him to the studio, let him see what you do and to see if this is really what he what he wants. And he did that. Picked me up one night, and one night as a producer, we went to see L. Cool J and Busta Rhymes and Black Raw, rest in peace. And he just went around playing music and the artists will pick the music that they love and start working. And I saw this process and was just like, it's the most incredible thing I've ever witnessed in life. And I know I'm only 15, 16 years old, Mitch, but this is who I want to be. This is who I want. This is what I want to do. And I just hit the ground running and never stopped. And, here, you know, here we are today, t- two decades later, produced by over 200 artists and touring the world with Trey songs as, as a music director and drummer for 15 years. It's, 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 it's a great, I'm really blessed, man, and grateful. That is, that is fantastic. I love that story. So was that your, your initial connection then with uh, Bad Boy and Hitman? Was that how you, because you kind of worked, you worked with the team for a while. Yeah, so at that age, it was, it was, a, dream, it was a dream for me, right? It, it was like, okay, these is a team of producers, Diddy and the Hitman, and these are a team of producers that I really look up to and admire musically, sonically, with, you know, uh, giving us the Notorious B.I.G. and all of the all amazing artists that, you know, Puff Daddy gave us at that time. These were the guys who I looked up to and looked towards, right, sound-wise. And especially when I was trying to figure out my sound as a producer, it was a lot of influence there by Bad Boy and Hitman. So, you know, to fast forward, once the opportunity developed uh, and, 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 and became available for me to become a Hitman, it was just like, wow, this is what I wanted to be as a little kid. I've always dreamt of having a moment like this. And what's cool about it is that when I was introduced to Puff, we had seen each other in passing, but when the real introduction happening and it was kind of the idea of me being a part of the team, I had already produced for over 50 artists. So I had kind of built my name, built my resume, had a little name to myself. And what got his attention was a record that I did for Sherry Dennis. Uh, we were working on our album at that time. And he was like, Yo, look at this song. And a little young kid named Amadeus. And, and I think what he what he appreciated was the sound that I brought to the album. It was really unique, really different, really soulful. And once he learned my age and was learning, I was producing that type of music. And he's like, who is this kid? You know, and that's how it came about. And the opportunity developed. And I'm like, absolutely. You know, and I tell a story and people, what that, why would you want to become a part of Bad Boy or Hitman and be a part of Puff when you kind of already established yourself as a producer already? And I, and I kind of compare it to this. I'm like, listen. It's like being in college. It's like being in high school, right? And you want to go to the NBA. 
you know, and you have the opportunity and, you know, the Chicago Bulls call and say, yo, <laughs> we want you on a team. And that's kind of how I looked at it, where it's like Puff is, you know, Phil Jackson and Biggie was Michael Jordan. And, you know, you, you have John Paxson and all those surrounding parts. And it's like, why wouldn't I go to a winning team? Why wouldn't I want to play, you know, in the NBA for a team that's won six championships? Like, yeah, I want to be on that team, too. I want to have that notoriety. I want to have that cosign, that blessing of, like, he's with us. And that's kind of my way of thinking and why I, I did it. And, and, you know, to be able to have that name and that title attached to my name, Bad Boy Hitman Producer, I'm going, I'm going to carry that title for the rest of my life. Right. You know, I earned it. I worked hard for it. It's legendary. When you hear it, people know what it is, know who it is. So grateful that that another dream of mine, you know, came true. Yeah. And that's a, another instance of taking advantage of an opportunity, but it's also absolutely in a situation like you're talking about where you're already established, you have to be able to drop your ego back and not say, Hey, I'm already, I'm already this. I don't need to go do that or whatever. You got to be open to the fact that there's more you can still learn and bring in. I, I, I applaud you for that. I love that, Mitch. Absolutely. And I love how you put that, man. It's like you, you, you accomplish things and it's like so much more to accomplish, so much more to learn. You know, this man has been, you know, yeah, I've been in the game for a, a few years, but he's been in the game for longer than me. And these, these uh, other team members has been in the game longer than me and have produced for some of my favorite artists. So it's like, why not get on a team, soak in all of that knowledge and wisdom and creativity and see how they work, see how they gel, see how things come about and be able to add that into what I do in my, in my music and in production. Right, right. You mentioned uh, your own individual sound there, and, and that's something that every musician, every producer, everybody wants to have their own unique sound. And of course, we all have the tools that we work with and the technology and things. And, and my question for you then is, is how do you get a fresh approach? And how do you develop your own sound when you're, when you're coming up? You know, you know, it's funny, Mitch. Um, I kind of fell into, I fell into my own sound organically, if that makes sense, right? I, because I didn't start out saying, hey, I want to sound like this. So I want to sound like that. Right. I actually approached it differently and, and opposite, actually, where it's like I want to produce records that you'll never think I produced. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the thing. If you have a sound, the song comes on, the track comes on. They're like, oh, such and such did that or such and such produced that. I didn't want to be that producer. I wanted I wanted to be able to trick you every time when a song comes out that I produce. You're like. You read the credits, you're like, oh, wow, I'm a day is behind that. Like, wow, I, didn't, I didn't know you can create that. And that's why when you think of all of the artists that I work with, like me being from New York, yes, I work with G, uh, G Unit and 50 Cent and Dipset and Cameron and Jim Jones and Remy Ma and Papoose, right? But then there's a whole other I work with, like Slim Thug and Paul Wall and Mike Jones, you know, from Houston and then The Game and Lil Easy from L.A. So it's like, and it, so I, I wanted to be that producer to be able to create anything and everything for any artist for any genre and once again once you open up that booklet which i miss so much of the credits you know you could be like oh wow i didn't think amadeus did that so i think kind of to kind of answer your question artists would tell me my signature would be the drums and the drum sounds and the patterns and kind of the drum the roles like you know how i would pr approach the pattern and, and, and kind of the fills that i would have in the pattern but you know depending on the track uh that i would create a lot of artists would say yo once the, once, once the track drop i would be like oh this might be amadeus this, this gotta be amadeus because the drums are hitting so hard and it feels so big and thick you know what i mean so i think right. that they kind of said that but again i kind of just approached it off of me creating what i feel um at the moment and whatever comes out comes out and, and, and i feel like that's me being authentic with me as a musician and myself. So when you as an artist or a songwriter or creative on the other side hear the song, I want I want you to be able to go and be wherever I was in that moment, feeling wise or create or creatively. Right. How much does the fact that you're a drummer, you're you're touring with Trey Songs, you're the music director, so you're on stage, you're playing the, the drums. How much do you bring, yes, sir. bring how much do you bring back from that into the studio when you're producing? Uh it's 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 kind of the best of both worlds. It's kind of a cheat code, you know, cheat code both ways, right? Like me being a musician and, and producing. It's like I'm a drummer already. So I have a, a, a certain way that I hear music is, is, is a certain feeling that I have and I'm able to articulate that, you know, live. And then vice versa, where it's just like, okay, me playing live, it, it gives me a different outtake and a different ways to look at different things as I approach production, right? So just to give an example, Mitch, me having a residency at a nightclub, Dre's nightclub in Las Vegas. I, as a drummer, I play alongside the DJ, right? So, and, and shout out to DJ friends. And um, 
So when we perform, there's no rehearsals. There's no, we don't even have a conversation. It's just a vibe and energy that's created, right? And he can throw on a Bruno Mars record or he can throw on a Migos song or a Fabulous song or a Fat Joe record or Chris Brown. And it's like, I'm able to navigate and go in whatever direction he goes in. And I remember him asking me like, how do you know what to do or where to go or what to play? And it's like, as a producer, there's a pattern. There's a pattern. Nine times out of 10, because it's programmed, it's going to be the same pattern. It, it might change. It might get a little different if it's eight bars. You know, maybe at the end of the eight bar, it might have a little fill there. So I can hear that. So I'll know to approach it the same way that when the next time it comes around. But it's the same pattern. You know, a lot of the trap music has the, you know, the, the, the hi-hat rolls and it's the same pattern. And he's looking at me as we go in and out of records. He's like, how is he, how is he doing? And it's like, bro, it's a cheat code. Me being a producer, know the pattern and I can feel the pattern. Like, even if I don't hit, know the record, give me two two bars. Give me two bars and me let it turn around one time and I'm in. Because it's going to repeat and it's going to loop and it's going to be the same thing. And the rest is what I do naturally in regards to filling it up. So it's definitely a cheat code on both ends for me. Yeah, right, right. So I'm curious when you're uh, then given your your status as a producer, you're the drummer, but you're also the music director, which means that you're in charge of what's happening on the stage, the other musicians, players, you know, the DJ, the people you're bringing together. How do you choose the members of the team that you're working with? So I had what made it life easier for me growing up in church. You know, I was surrounded by some of the best musicians and my brothers ever. So it was a thing of like, once I had the opportunity to go into a trade, I'm like, I just called my boys up that place in church. It was like, y'all want to go on tour? And at the end of the day, when you think about it, Mitch, every musician's dream is to go on tour, is to hit the road. You know, especially musicians that come out of school or musicians that come from church. You have those dreams and aspirations of hitting that big stage, you know, and, and playing in arenas and, and theaters and and. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and those type of venues in, in front of hundreds and thousands of people, sometimes millions. And, you know, so once I kind of introduced that to them, they were like, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? We, we absolutely. And the funny thing, Mitch, is we didn't know that it would it would be this long. We just thought it was going to be like a little quick little run. All right, we're going to be out for a few weeks, you know, and then cool. We'll all go back to church and, and say, hey, we lived this moment. It was cool. It was excellent. A, uh, a great opportunity great experience and that was 15 years ago <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and and of course prior to the pandemic we've been on a road ever since and we've been i wouldn't say everywhere i'd say almost everywhere there's still some places that we haven't uh performed as of yet and hopefully we have the opportunity to do so but we've been everywhere man so it's definitely a musician's uh, a dream to go on the road so like i said i just called my brothers up that i've been playing with all my life as a as a little kid so we know each other like the back of our hands and you know if you've ever seen a Trey Songs concert or a show or performance, you can tell the chemistry and the bond and the brotherhood that we have. We don't need like months and months of rehearsals and all of those type of things because we know each other so well. And even Trey, of us, you know, working alongside Trey, we I know what he wants. I without him saying a word, I know if he's feeling a certain kind of way, whether just the look or 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 or, or just his energy, you know, and that's 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 who we are. Right, right. That's awesome. So another aspect of what you do is, of course, with the name Amadeus, you'd expect is composing. And so you've you've written uh, ESPN and BET and VH1 and, of course, a whole variety of, of advertisements and things as well. Talk a little bit about your composing process. You know what, Mitch? It's, it's funny because th- those, like you said, are always taking advantage of opportunities. Those opportunities kind of fell in a lot based off of relationships, based off of what I've done musically, especially in the hip hop world. So a lot of when the music directors would reach out, they would want what I've created already, which, you know, kind of made it cool for me because it kind of allowed me to stay authentic to who I am as a musician, as a producer. Before I started doing hip um, R&B and pop, and it was always hip hop. You know, hip hop mm-hmm. was the first love and what I gravitated towards first. So they would reach out and say, hey man, we would need, you know, kind of uh, what you did for so-and-so or that artist. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And nine times out of 10, I would already have that in the arsenal <laughs> and already locked and loaded with it. And they would just kind of give me a description of what they were looking for. And if I didn't have it, I would create it. And if I already had it created, I would just, you know, give them what they've asked for. And that's kind of what the relationship kind of turned into, especially with ESPN. Um, I did the theme song for ESPN First Take. Um, uh, and, you know, I do a lot of the scoring for Sports Center and you know, the highlights when they're talking about the Knicks or the Gi- or the Giants or, or, or Brooklyn Nets, you know, was, you know, East Coast all day. You know, the Yankees, <laughs> the Mets, 
it's kind of cool to hear, you know, my music play in the background. And, and again, the approach to that is kind of how I always was always approached it being that I'm just kind of doing what I've done, so, you know, even with Sprite, Burger King, because a lot of those companies and corporations, of course, want to tap into the hip hop world um, because it's one of the most, I wouldn't say the one of the, but just a very successful genre um, in the game, in the world right now. And, and I'm just grateful. I'm glad. And I'm sure you can realize it too, Mitch, just kind of glad to see that it, it, it get the notoriety and the love that it deserves. Because, you know, oftentimes rock and pop and, you know, th those type of genres really gets known for the biggest, but hip hop is really big in, in the world. Right, right. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you're also uh, doing things outside the direct musical world, like uh, your your uh, uh, 101 Music College tour and your motivational yes, speaker, and you're an author now. And, and tell us about some of those uh, those other activities that you're working in. Yeah, you know the speaking thing. I've always loved pushing, especially kids, to you know chase and live their dreams. Um, me being from where I'm from. You know, there's a lot of the kids. It, every 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 place you go, and I've learned this touring, everywhere in the world has a tough neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that deals with the same things and in different ways, right? It looks different, you know, and affects people differently, right? But the point is, there's always challenges that kids face. You know, so no matter where I go in the world, I try to connect with those people and and just show them, like, listen, I'm from where you're from. We're from different states. Different cities, yes, but it's from the same, you know, drugs are drugs, gangs are gangs. It's like, it ain't like yours is different from mine. It's, it's all negative. So it's about trying to figure out how to avoid those things and choose a path in life that you love and that you're most passionate about and, and go in a different direction, no matter how difficult it is. So that was kind of the, the blueprint and how it started for me. And as I went on, we just kind of put more of a professional approach on what I was doing and, and the speaking engagements and kind of catered, catered it more to the business, the music business side of things. Mm -hmm. You know, you meet so many people that are artists and, and, and songwriters and singers and dancers that have the gift, have the talent, but don't understand the business side of it. So I kind of wanted to go into these colleges and give them the blueprint, the do's and the don'ts, you know, the rights and the wrongs and kind of introduce them to all of the other areas in music business that they can function in. It's not about just being on stage or being in the forefront. You could be a manager, you could be an engineer. You know what I mean? You could be a stylist, you could be a barber, you could be an A&R. So it's like, oh, I didn't know I could do all of those different things. So it's been really great. Of course, the pandemic hit, which caused us to kind of shut it down. But hopefully now that things are opening back up, we'll be able to get back to it, man. But just, you know, a kid from the Bronx that doesn't have a college degree to be, absolutely, you know, teaching and, and, and giving panels at a Harvard or a NYU or, you know, a Howard you know, um, Yale is just like, wow, you know, and it just, yeah. it just shows you that you can do anything you want to do in life. And there's no real set rules on how to get there and how to go about doing it. You know what I mean? So right. sometimes you break the rules in order uh, to be successful and to be great. Right, man. It's uh, it's, it's so inspirational. And I, and I know that uh, it, it gets people excited to take advantage of yeah. what, they can, what they can do, you know, and you're giving back. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Mitch. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned, you're also an author now. Yeah. Oh, man. It, the story of Amadeus and the beat goes on. Um, it's kind of an idea that I've always dreamt of doing. I've always kind of wanted to uh, create a book and, and, and just inspire people. Like I said, what I've been doing with the speaking engagements and speaking, I just kind of wanted to give something, people something tangible to be able to walk away with. Oftentimes, and I'm sure you can relate to this, you sit down with kids, you sit down with people, and you give so much information and sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other. And then once you leave or, or they leave your presence, you know, some of the stuff gets caught in the wind and goes missing, you know, but if you can actually give something uh, to people in their hand that they can walk away with and, and, and kind of refer back to maybe when they're doubtful or maybe when they're not feeling themselves or feeling positive or, you know, kind of inspired in a way. And you can go back to that book of, of how Amadeus became Amadeus and, and be inspired by it. So that was the blueprint and that was the goal for it. Um, very proud of it. It was done during the pandemic, uh, which was definitely, I would say, one of the most difficult times for myself, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially. And I'm sure everybody that's tuned in, Mitch, you can relate to that as well, being in the music industry. Everything we do has to do with people. It has to do with others, shows, performances, creating, interviews, you know, so to be removed from that really took a toll for me, man. And I actually lost uh, my bishop and pastor, uh, Bishop uh, Pastor Michelle White, who during that time, too, 
who was very influential to me as a musician and really taught me all that I know uh, and was, you know, the church that I started playing in. Um, so she passed during that pandemic. So it was just real difficult. And, and I could just kind of hear her whisper as she would do as, as a kid and even up to an adult where she would say, you got this, baby, you know, keep going. Right. You know, God got you. And I just would hear that in my ear. And I said, you know, I got to I gotta get this book done. And, and what's crazy is the book was done prior to her passing. And I kind of created a, a special moment in the book for her. But when she passed, I kind of halted everything and, and, and got the team on the phone. It was like, I have to create an even bigger moment to celebrate her and to really go into more detail of how how much of an impact she's made on my life. Um, so I'm really proud of it because I was able to push through all of the challenges and the difficulties, you know, push through the pain in order to create something beautiful. Um, and the book is, is beautiful. It's been a blessing. Uh, kids and not only kids, but adults have really been appreciating it. Um, so I'm very, very, very proud of it, man. And, and thank you for for bringing it up, Mitch. And I appreciate the love and support for it. Yeah, right on, man. It, you, you should be proud of it. That's an accomplishment. You know, it's, it's yet another one of those those avenues that you're exploring, which is so cool. So yes, sir. Thank you. One other thing you're doing that I think is really cool is I've, I've seen a few different avenues where musicians, people who are creating music, can get their music to you where you can kind of comment on it and, and do uh, responses to that. And I, I'm curious about the kinds of things you're seeing. And also, is there any common common thing you see with those where you're like man everybody does this one thing that's wrong <laughs> you, you know what i mean is there something that everybody's right. missing when they with, with the music that you see right and thanks for asking man there's so much stuff i got going on it's hard to keep up with i'm glad you're remembering <laughs> um, uh, so it's called it's called the sit down when i'm a deus and like you said it's it's a lot of people reach out to me whether it's via dm on on social media or inboxing me or sending emails and it's a lot and mm -hmm. it's a lot and it's very overwhelming. And I'm the type of person I'm sure you can probably see. I love to help people. I love to connect and, and show love and just be a blessing. And it, 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 it can be a lot. It can be overwhelming um, And because I'm, I'm only one person. And I, I created this platform to really give an opportunity for people to be face to face. I was doing it face to face before the pandemic. Uh, now I do it via Zoom. Uh, but just to have my undivided attention, you know, they can send me something. They can send anybody anything and say, hey, you heard it. You know, and you can be, you know, and, and not tell the truth and say, yeah, I think it's cool, you know, and <laughs> right. it's like I wanted to create a moment where you're looking at me with face to face, whether it's Zoom, whether it's live and in person, and you're actually seeing me and hearing me listen to your music right in front of your face. So it's no question of did you listen or not? I'm doing it right in front of you. And it just allows those creatives to pick my brain, to ask whatever questions they want to ask, to give whatever advice they need to get. And not only just them asking questions, but I can hear it and maybe in their music that some things they need to change. I can hear the direction they're going in and kind of give them advice, you know, make sure that from a business sense, um, it's all good. And that's kind of the answer to the other part of your question where a lot of music is out there, a lot of creativity, you know, but when it comes down to the business and making sure that their songs are registered and make sure that, the, you know, people are being credited right in the percentages and understanding um, uh, song splits and split sheets and just having things right and on point. That seems to be the common thing that a lot of these creators don't have. And when they come and have this conversation with me and they leave the conversation, they're like, wow, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. And it's like, yeah, you can have all this great music. But if the business side of it is not on point, how do you eat? How do you survive? How do you get those checks that you're supposed to be getting of, it, of your song possibly being played in McDonald's in UK? You have no idea because you're not signed up with an ASCAP BMI or CSAC. You don't even know what that is. You don't even know that it's 100% in a song. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that I that I notice happens with a lot of the creators, and I have to always kind of keep shedding light on. And, you know, again, when they walk away from the conversation, they're so grateful. And now, you know, some of the songs, some of the artists only know about SoundCloud. So, you know, they don't even know about the different outlets of them getting their music on Apple and Spotify and Tidal. And it's like, yeah, you're going to have to get either TuneCore or, you know, the other competitors in it. So it's, it's great. And it feels good at the end of the day to be able to educate those creatives and put them and point them in the, in the right direction for them to at least get on the right track. Yeah, that's very cool. That one on one time has got to be so valuable for uh, for someone who's who's trying to be a success in the business. And like you said, Absolutely. the business is such and a again, huge part of it. I didn't have that. And we didn't have that, Mitch, coming up. So it's like I kind of wanted to break the curse of, of of people having to figure it out like we did. We had to figure it out. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have social media. 
you know, everything we did was face to face or or mail, <laughs> you know, like real right. mail, not an email like mail, <laughs> right. you know. So, you know, ev- everything is at everyone's fingertips today. And I think sometimes it people people don't appreciate that. Like it's it's like it's like, do you understand what we had to go through to get to where we are today versus you not having to go through what we went through? Like everything is so much easier. And it's like sometimes everything becomes oversaturated with the fact that it is easy and obtainable so and mm-hmm. everybody their mama want to be artists and producers and singers and songwriters everybody want to get a laptop and get pro tools or logic or fruity loops and just say hey i'm a producer i'm a musician i'm an artist and it's like are you doing it because it's easy to do or are you doing it because everything is at your fingertips or are you doing it because you love it you know and mm-hmm. that's kind of the other thing where it's like people are doing it to get famous people are doing it to get rich and it's like man listen that ain't it because i tell you right now I ain't rich. <laughs> and I've been doing this for, you know, 20 decades. Everybody's story, two decades, excuse me. Everybody's story is different. And what the, the door or opportunities that someone may have been presented, you know, may not be the same for you. So I'm very honest, very transparent with people. And I feel like that's the best way to be always. Right, right. That's awesome. So when Thank I when I it. when I wrap one of these interviews up, I always ask the same question with somebody like yourself who's been in the industry and and accomplished and done so much. And you've been surrounded by through your career a lot of really great artists. You know, you you listed <laughs> uh, through through the interview we've we've listed a, a whole bunch of them there, Jennifer Lopez and Chris Brown and Diddy and I mean the list goes on and on and on. So my question for you is, what makes a great artist? Mm, love that. I think for me because people would ask, you know, can, will you work for me? What type of artist you work with? I work with the, the type of artists that are authentic to who they are, you know, that understand who they are, that understand what they want to share with the world, that love themselves, that love their story, that love the pain and the hurt and the challenges that they've been through and are are good with articulating that on record and, and, and being vulnerable, you know? So those are a lot of the qualities that I feel makes uh, a successful and an amazing artist, right? Because when you share your music with the world, it's in hopes that they can relate to what it is that you share, you know? So that's why you have to be real open and honest and sincere about that because some, you know, it's, it's life-changing. Music is, is, is so many different things. It's healing, it's love, it's, it gets people through tough times, you know? And it takes for you to be real and authentic for it to connect with the world, you know? And obviously it's not gonna connect with any and everybody. It's gonna connect with who can relate to that subject matter or can relate to whatever it is that, that you're talking about topic wise. So to me, that's what I feel is, is, is most important. And then it's the other side of that, which is, is, which is having integrity and, and, and being a man or woman of their word and, and respecting the producer and respecting the creatives and making sure that the business is handled uh, just as well and as good as the creativity. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's music, but then it's music and business and you put those things together. And I just love when artists are incredible creatively and, and with the music, but also incredible with the business side of things too. And you bring that together and have the music business and it just, it just makes life great. Right, right. You said a couple of, of interesting things there. Uh, actually, you said something interesting and you didn't say something interesting. And I'll touch on both of them. <laughs> so the one that I thought was interesting is you were talking about the, the music that you make. Not everybody's going to love it. And sometimes yeah. in this day and age with social media and, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing, it, it can get pretty hard to recognize yeah. that, that not everybody loves everything you're going to do. How do you deal That's with that? True. How do you deal with that? Um, at the end of the day, you know, Mitch, we're all human beings. So I can't sit here and act like, OK, when people don't appreciate it or they don't like it, that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt. It, it, it sucks because it's, it's, it's your blood, sweat and tears. It's what you've poured out of your heart and soul. So you always want which you've given to the world to be respected, loved, and appreciated it. Uh, but some, you know, sometimes it hurts, but I think the longer you've been a part of the process and you understand how things work, and just as you're human, you kind of respect the fact that on the other side, the fan and the listener is human as well, and they have a right to either give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You know, right. it, it comes with the territory. So I think as creatives, you kind of know going into it that you can't always, you know, uh, wear your feelings on your sleeves, man. You know, you got to be willing to have a hard shell um, and be able to take, you know, uh, constructive criticism, whether good or not so good. It comes with the territory. Right, right. And then as an artist, it works the other way as well, right? You have to, even if you yeah. don't, even if you don't love the music someone's doing, you have, you have to respect the artistry and the, the yeah, talent and the work that they're putting into it. 
I agree. It takes a lot of time and energy, you know. So you got, like you said, respect. I think respect is is is, is due for everyone. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? All across the board. You don't gotta love it, but at least at least have respect for that person and 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 for that creative art. Right. Coming back to the second point, what you didn't touch on is something that I've asked that question to. 250 musicians and producers and wow. engineers in every in every genre in, in interviews and things and right. I I can't think of a single one where what came up was man they were the best drummer in the world or they were the most fantastic vocalist or they wrote the best lyrics or you know it's it's never about that kind of thing it's always about the being authentic the you know the, yeah. the, the, that aspect of it yeah you know I, I I and I say this all the time where I I just feel like perfection doesn't exist right. Um, there's no such thing as perfect. There's no p- perfect person, no perfect melody. Somewhere down the line is a flaw or somewhere down the line it's been used. You know, I feel like I say we always, we're all, we're all borrowing. Like music has been here for centuries. You know, it ain't just start yesterday. So something that you've done somehow, some way has been done before you've approached it differently, but somehow, some way it's been done. And I say this all the time, you know, you, you know, you don't have to be great to be great. You know, and people will be like, wow, what do you mean by that? And it's like, you don't have to be the best drummer, the best singer, the best producer, the best engineer to be the best producer, the best drummer. It's just about being the best you you can be without any comparison. Right. Uh, You know, I look up to different drummers and it's like, man, some things that, you know, these, you know, drummers do that I may not have a hand on. I may not know how to do it. And it's like, I can't devalue myself as a musician as a drummer because there's something there's this feel i can't do or this role that i can't understand musically or the- theoretically like it's just like i gotta take what i have and use that to the my to the best of my ability so that's why i feel like you know as long as you're being real and honest you might not have perfect pitch you might not you know it might take us a hundred takes to get you know that one song done but at the end of the day it's about the end result and if it feels good and if it feels amazing and it's authentic you know, I can get down with that versus somebody coming in and just going through the whole thing. Well, one take, but then the feeling is not there. The energy is not there. The story is not there. You just, you just talented. You know what I'm saying? And lyrics right. and gift and just, you can sing notes around anybody, but what does it feel like? I'd rather have a, you know, and, and this is debatable. I'd rather have a pitchy note that feels amazing where I can feel the pain. I can feel the hurt. I can feel the love, then I have a perfect pitch. And and, it, and it's just like emotional. It's, like just, it's just like, well, where were they when they created that? It's like, well, anybody could have done that. It just doesn't feel good, you know? Right. That, that is a hard uh, level of discernment to reach because especially yeah. with today's tools, we can make things perfect. Right. Uh, you can, that is true. You can uh, manufacture the music, I guess, <laughs> in, a, in a way. That is true. Uh, so, so reaching that level of, of, uh, of taste and I guess discernment is the the word to uh, to be yeah. able to recognize that man. That's that's very cool. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And 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 you know sometimes you have control over it as a producer. And sometimes you don't. A lot of yeah. some artists have engineers that they work alongside. They have their templates of what they use and what they put on their vocals, and that's that. And sometimes you know you have a say so in it, and sometimes you don't. You know what I mean? So there's records where it's like, oh, it's a little bit of too much of the auto tune on that, or you wouldn't look crazy on that. I would have pulled back a little bit, but you know. You can't tell some of the biggest artists in the world. It's like, yo, I think I would take that off. It's like, uh, you know, you, you got to be your low. You got to tread lightly. You got to tread right. lightly sometimes. You know what I mean? Choose your battles. <laughs> right. And sometimes that's their that's their thing. Sometimes yeah. that that is their their expression and, and all that too. So yeah. it's, you know, their the, signature, their sound, and what people appreciate. So you don't want to go against the grain sometimes. Sometimes you got to just go with the grain. <laughs> right. There's room for all of it. <laughs> yes, sir. Man, thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, and your your energy and your inspirational story with us. It's it's really been a pleasure to sit down with you today. No, thank you for having me, Mitch. This has been a, uh, an amazing conversation. I hope you know, I hope all of the viewers that have the opportunity to hear this conversation, you know, are, are educated in their own way and, and inspired and motivated to whether it's music or whatever their endeavors are. You know, it's all the same principles to me. You know, you work hard, you hustle, you have faith, you believe in yourself, you put the work in. You know, you move accordingly. You 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 be a man or a woman of integrity and, and, and positivity, you know, um, you know, and believe in karma, you know, karma is a big thing, you know, treat people how you want to be treated, you know, and that'll, that'll, you'll go a long way with that. So thank you again for me, for having me. Shout out to the whole Sweetwater family. Honored to be a part of the team. Again, this is a dream come true, oh, you know, for me to even be on this platform. So thank you, Mitch. Thank you to the whole team. I appreciate you all. Right on. Thanks so much. And I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely. Whenever you need me, we can do a part, part two, three, four, five. Whatever. There we go. There's always something to talk about. <laughs> I love it. All right. Take care. 
All right, Mitch. Blessings. Yep. And thank you for joining me today. We've been talking to Amadeus, and I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. 